everyone and welcome to Felina's Pages to another study guide for the Edexcel AS level curriculum. Today we're talking about Eat Me by Patience Sekwavi, poet born to Nigerian parents in London and she is famous for being a solo performer in many prestigious literary festivals but also for being part of a group called Atomic Lip. It's a performance group that reads poetry as if it was a pop group essentially. So this poem may contain themes that are potentially triggering such as eating the Order, so please proceed at your own discretion and without further ado let's dive into the summary and analysis. It may explore themes of obsession, transgression and taboo, gender roles and relationships. In Eat Me, there is a female speaker talking about her relationship with a male, he. He forces her to eat for his own sick pleasure and he continues to force feed her until eventually she cannot take it anymore and revolts against him and drowns him in her flesh, meaning that her body becomes so heavy that she simply smothers him. Eat Me is a very disturbing poem with a very melancholy tone and a sense of submission the entirety of the first part of the poem. However, towards the end, as the speaker grows empowered and realizes that she cannot take this anymore, it takes on a more dominant tone and she becomes more in control. Let's look briefly at the title first. So Eat Me is written in capital letters, symbolizing both the significance and the gravity of it all. It symbolizes the growth of the words Eat Me. Eat and me. They are both very important and she's growing both physically and emotionally as she's forced to eat. Eat Me is also written as an imperative showing that he commands her in all stages of her life. He says, eat me. The cake says, eat me. Even the food ends up commanding her, though although he is ultimately the puppet master behind it. Eat Me can also be an allusion to Alice in Wonderland because the speaker is very childish and submissive to authority at first. She simply does what she is told and there's a suggestion that he's the adult figure because he ultimately provides for her and cares for her. The structure of the poem is 10 rigid tersets throughout, demonstrating how rigid and impressive her relationship is. Alternatively, you could look at this as a battle with your inner self, with the male speaker being an alter ego representing gluttony, one of the seven sins, and so she has to constantly fight with her own self as well. There's a high frame throughout this poem, showing the uncertainty and ambiguity of it all. The speaker is unsure even of her own words, suggesting that this is the effect of societal pressures. Women end up losing their sense of self. If you look at this through the post-colonial lens too and we will see this theme later on, then you can also take this as a commentary of uncertainty about what to do next because these countries, these former colonies, have fought for, for years to gain independence. They have fought, they have lived with one goal in life, to gain their freedom and now that freedom is here, they are unsure of what to do, unsure of how to proceed without commands from higher ups and yes this is what they wanted but they no longer have that clear set goal in life and that is both exhilarating because they finally got their goals and frightening because they realize that they're about to embark on a new stage in their lives. When I hit 30, he bought me a cake. Three layers of icing, homemade, a candle for each stone and weight. At first you think that the 30 is about the age, that this is a very happy and cheerful poem. Look how much her boyfriend cares about her. He bought her a cake, he put so much care into it. He remembered her birthday, he made the icing homemade, he made everything homemade. But then you realize that it's more disturbing than that. It's about weight. And I think that this very much shows the progression of a relationship from something happy to something disturbing in many abusive relationships relationships because it starts off as oh he cares about me so much but then as you proceed and as time goes on you start to realize that those pink glasses need to be taken off and that essentially what he's doing is he's abusing you just for the sake of his own pleasure he doesn't actually love her he just wants her to be fat and to grow fatter and so even when he brings her this cake under the guise of celebrating her he's celebrating his own achievements in getting her to be in his control. We can also observe some assonance here if we're talking technical devices with similar sounds of A and E, and this is a little bit unusual. So I've mentioned before that we have those half rhymes and the assonance make it sound like it's the rhyme is there, but it's not quite there. And it never really breaks this rigid structure. And so it shows that although every woman in such relationships is forced to conform and her entire life is dictated, every woman is still different. Every case is different. Every case is unique. The form is also pretty much end stop throughout this entire poem, demonstrating the finality and the routine of women stuck in these relationships because they cannot get out anymore. The icing was white, but the letters were pink. They said, eat me. And I ate, did what I was told, didn't even taste it. 
White is usually associated with ideas of purity and innocence and pink with femininity and flesh and it's a little bit ironic here because when you think of this like pure girls you don't you think of these dainty pretty things who are so innocent who have no idea what intercourse is who exist in their own state of like ideal kindness and being this perfect daughter of god and then you have the speaker showing that she feels this alienation in everything yes she is a woman yes she has flesh but she has too much flesh she cannot be this idea of simple purity anymore and we see these sexual innuendos throughout she's far from innocent and yet for her she is innocent because he sees himself as the one in control the cake is white it's a blank canvas because he sees her as a blank canvas he wants to create his own expectations at first it seems very nice like oh these pretty pink letters but it's very much representative of her flesh so even as he gives her this cake he has that goal in mind he thinks pink because i want her to be full of that pink and it also like if you think about it deeper pink is ultimately made by coloring red and white so it's like he's putting blood on her purity he's staining her purity just to make this pink just to have more flesh he's essentially ruining her purity for his own pleasure writing eat me as well it's also very much in order and i think this could be an allusion to the suffragette movements because they were forced to eat by the government because they didn't want them to starve and to die because then the media would pick it up and so essentially here she's alluding to the struggle of women that here you have to eat this and again this links back to eating disorders because for skinnier women who are suffering from eating disorders and from feeling like they are fat but they are actually skinny they are constantly told to eat more uh, to the point where it becomes an obsession and then there's the other side so women like the speaker here who are just constantly forced to eat eat me is also like the potion in the book alice in wonderland which i've also mentioned at the beginning when discussing the title when alice e uh, when alice eats this little cake she grows bigger she grows physically taller and i think here this is both physically and emotionally because the speaker is getting too big for her house physically because she is just growing in size and emotionally because she can't take it anymore and at some point somebody's gonna have to break and she ultimately ch uh, chooses that the atmosphere has to break and she is the one who will survive also here i want to point out that it's very passive it's not really like I eat the cake, it's I ate, I did what I was told, she just follows the orders, she doesn't really enjoy this cake, it's not a celebration for her, she just sees it, oh, it's my birthday, oh, I have to eat, oh, I have to like provide him with pleasure and with satisfaction. But already we can see these slight inklings of rebellion, and starting a sentence with and is one of those things that everyone has heard throughout their life, it's grammatically incorrect, don't do it. But here the speaker does it and it feels very deliberate because she's starting to rebel in her own ways. Like even thinking about the idea that she doesn't want to eat the cake that is disturbing is already a rebellion. Especially because if you spend a lot of time in this very toxic atmosphere and environment that teaches you that you have to eat, that he loves me so I have to do what he wants these small thoughts, these small acts, they are very large rebellions for the women involved. Then he asked me to get up and walk round the bed so he could watch my broad belly wobble, hips chugger like a juggernaut. Broad belly wobble. So the alliteration emphasizes this, this B sound. It's a very unpleasant image of just flesh hitting upon flesh. It's clear that the speaker detests her body. She doesn't want to be like this. She is forced to be like this because he is forcing her into the situation. And over the next few stanzas, we see an example of heteroglossia. So I have actually never heard of this term before, but it made sense for me as a Russian speaker because as the glass list, to be more accurate, which was this idea proposed by a Russian intellectual to explain that peasants co communicated with different people differently so for example amongst each other they had one language amongst the nobility they had another language amongst speaking with members of the church it was another way so like to show that they were god conforming and if we talk about um heteroglossia in the poetical sense then here we see that it's simply putting different voices and different perspectives and over the next few stanzas we will see his voice really come through as he comes into power as he grips her with his strong dominating hands and forces her to eat even more food we see his opinions on women the idea of a feeder role is very prominent in this poem 
it's very important in sexual relationships, the feeder, again, this innuendo, but also in just basic caregiver relationships. And so having like belly wobble as a very childlike description, again, emphasizes that he is the primary care. Juggernaut is just something with huge, immense amounts of power, something really big and strong. But Juggernaut can also be described, uh, can also be used as a word to describe a lorry. So her hips are like a lorry carrying her weight. So if you don't know what a lorry is, like a van, like basically just a very big car. And we have this image of a car that's literally dying out. You know those very big vans that just sort of inch down the road and when you drive behind them you're scared that they're literally gonna fall apart and this is her because she's ba barely continuing forward but she knows that she cannot stop right now because this will be the end of those things and we see her uh character arc as she realizes that eventually this must stop and eventually this lorry must do something it either must fall or it must continue onwards the bigger the better, he'd say. I like big girls, soft girls, girls I can burrow inside with multiple chins, masses of cellulite. The repetition of girls shows how he looks down on women, how he doesn't really care for women, how for him this is just girls and oh, I'm this strong guy who's in control through putting women down. And also shows that she's not the only one. It's a reminder that to women in abusive relationships that you're not the first one he has done this to most probably. There have been others. He does not love you. He likes the feeling of power. He loves her appearance. He doesn't love the speaker. And I also want to talk a little bit about beauty standards in Nigeria. So they're a bit different from the Western world in that in Nigeria, um, from literature that I've read, I have gathered that people prefer bigger girls as a sign of like wealth and prosperity and good health and here I think this can also be taken as a critique of that that essentially you are forcing women to conform to the standard and eventually they eat so much that they can't leave so like you slowly ingest them with the poison of societal expectations every year and it comes to the point where they can't leave and progress to bigger things they have to give up their dreams and ambitions I was his jacuzzi, but he was my cook. My only pleasure was the rush of fast food. His pleasure? To watch me swell like forbidden fruit. So this is a powerful image of him diving into her again in the nuendo. So she's just like this giant pool of flesh and he just burrows into her. And burrows, bury, to burrow, sounds very similar. So he buries her. He wishes her chance by simply putting his desires before her health. And there's also this image of her being his pool that he can sink into. So she's something for him to relax. And for her, he's the cook. Again, he's the person that provides for her, that cares for her. She simply has no other choice because this is a financial disparity. He gives her food. Who else will feed her? Who else will sustain her if she leaves this relationship? And this rush of fast food, these fricative Fs, it shows that there's just this feeling of a sigh, of a cause of like she has to eat and for her this is no longer pleasure or enjoyment there's just a rush she eats food and then she falls into oblivion she forgets all her thoughts and aspirations of oh maybe this is not the life for me i can do better things she only starts thinking about food this is an addiction now and we also have um, another potential biblical reference here with the forbidden fruit so the forbidden fruit here is the original sin, so women and giving in to temptation. And I think here it's sort of working through that and saying that actually this sin has consequences, both for women and for men. So men cannot just impose their rules, this, oh, you can't do that, oh, you can't do this, without consequence for them, because ultimately the speaker drowns the man. But this also has consequences for women because if they bite into the forbidden fruit, if they start realizing that they need to do something about their lives, this leads to social change, which can be very difficult to process. His breadfruit, his desert island after shipwreck, or a beached whale on a king-sized bed, craving a wave. I was a tidal wave of flesh. If you are analyzing this from the post-colonial perspective, here you could see the semantic field of well, the sea and just the tropical and exotic places in general, like breadfruit, island, tidal wave. And wave shows that she's very much getting swept away in this like constant cycle of abuse. And ultimately, she is the beached whale because of her own size. She lies in a king-sized bed. He is like a royal and she just lies there because she can't move. And this image of a whale, although it shows her size, it also shows her 
helplessness. Because whales are these very strong, powerful creatures in their natural environment, in the sea when they get to move around and enjoy themselves, no matter how big their size is. But here she does not have that freedom to enjoy herself. Here she's simply a whale who wants to go back into the ocean, but there is no wave. She is waiting for that wave, for that tidal wave of rescue to come and sweep her along. And ultimately, she becomes that wave because she becomes so big that she is the wave that saves herself. Too fat to leave, too fat to buy a pint of full fat milk, too fat to use fat as an emotional shield, too fat to be called chubby, cuddly, big built. The effort of too fat shows how society is constantly thinking about weight. They just do not let her process it otherwise. You are too fat to do this, you are too fat to do that. Women are too fat to leave because they are afraid of what people will say. Oh, she emerged from that relationship and she looks like that? No, she's too fat. We won't accept her. Oh, of course she's buying full fat milk. She can't make healthier decisions for herself. She can't control herself. She is a useless member of society. These are the kinds of judgments that women have to go through if they're fat. And men as well, but of course here we're focusing specifically on women and on the toxic expectations of female beauty standards. Notice also how there is not really, again, a first person or a third person. It's just too fat because there's n it's so dehumanizing that there is no person. Because ultimately she can't hide from this. She doesn't have any protection. She realizes that she's just fat and no matter what she does, that's all that society will see her as. Society puts this label of fat onto her and this label of fat controls everything she does in her life. The day I hit 39, I allowed him to stroke my globe of a cheek. His flesh, my flesh, flowed. He said, open wide, poured olive oil down my throat. So globe is something massive, her globe of a cheek, but it's very much a juxtaposition because just a few stanzas ago we had the idea of a shipwreck. So it shows how she's so big on the outside and so small on the inside. How she feels so full and giant and powerful on the outside, but actually she's lonely and she has no more opportunities because of him on the inside. Nine years have passed again and he's force feeding her again this reference to force feeding because olive oil is this very dense it chokes you up indeed the assonance in olive oil those ooh sounds they evoke this image of choking of this heavy oil being so dense just like her because the more she drinks the more dense she herself becomes it's a vicious cycle that she can't escape and he forces her to open wide Actually, she doesn't want to open wide, she doesn't want to drink this olive oil, who would? But he forces her to. And now we see that she is tolerating him, she allows him to stroke her cheek. Because we're getting ready for the turn. Soon you'll be 40, he whispered. And how could I not roll over on top? I rolled and he drowned in my flesh. I drowned his dying sentence out. That is the rebellion we have been building towards. Prompted by the scary promise of even more food in a year of soon you'll be 40, I'll do this, 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 this scary promise, the speaker takes the decision to change her life. Notice also how it's phrased as a question, how could I not roll over on top, but there's no question mark, because when it comes down to it, this is not a question. It is not up to us to judge her or to decide that no, she shouldn't have just drowned him out, because this is it, this is her decision, and it's a decision that came because of a culmination of abuse over the years. She does not care what we think. She rolls. He drowns. I drowned his dying sentence out. She simply uses her weight for revenge. Even his dying sentence, it doesn't give her any emotion. She doesn't care what his last words to her would be. She cares only of getting herself on top and just drowning him out completely. She cares about losing, uh, using her weight as a revenge. Ultimately, it was his own greed that killed him because he wanted her to be this big and now she's big enough to go against her oppressor. Again, look at the post-colonial themes. They wanted to develop the colonies to have them prosperous for the sake of the wealthy nation in control. And now that the colony is prosperous, they no longer want to be in control of that wealthy nation. They want to have their own path in life because they worked for it. And so she rebels. I left him there for six hours that felt like a week. His mouth slightly open, his eyes bulging with greed. There was nothing else left in the house to eat. 
She leaves him for what feels like a very long time because she needs to process this massive change. She also leaves him as he was his whole life, eyes bulging with greed. He's greedy for more and in a way he gets what he wanted so he sort of eats her. Her weight is in his mouth. Ultimately she is the one that eats him because the poem ends on a very sinister line. There was nothing else left in the house to eat. So we have the suggestion, did she eat him? Or is the speaker simply saying that this is the end, there is no more food in the house and she should, she is just left to essentially shrug off all this weight because there is nothing more to eat. And this is potentially a melancholy ending because like this is her death too, but also potentially a victorious one. Because maybe as she loses her weight, she will find enough strength to instead of rolling over walk and to go and seek help and to leave this toxic environment. So I think that this poem very much leaves room for that final bit of interpretation and imposing your own meaning. It also highlights that women ultimately have to make that choice. So you can't just decide to say, like, oh, I'm still thinking about it. You have to make that choice of committing yourself and freeing yourself from this relationship. All right, that concludes this video. I hope you enjoyed this brief study guide, this summary and analysis. Please do let me know your own interpretations, your own thoughts in the comments.